Today's episode is brought to you by Oxenham Group. Disengaged employees cost U.S. companies up to $550 billion per year, and a recent Gallup poll showed that only 33% of the U.S. workforce considers itself engaged. How are you ensuring that the people you hire are engaged? The Oxenham Group is a recruiting company that focuses on why a person takes a job and what makes them stay. They do this by understanding one's motivation, skills, and personal mission. Oxenham's proprietary process focuses on three main areas. Sociologist prepared questions, IBM proven assessments, and Gallup Clifton strengths. The combined results give the interviewer valuable insight into the potential for close alignment and the likelihood of engagement. Reach out today to learn more about how you can identify highly engaged people and harness the power of alignment with Oxenham Group. For more information, please call 605-610-3026 or visit their website at oxenhamgroup.com. Hey everyone, welcome to Canopy Cast. This is John Michael Price. With me are my two co-hosts, Christopher McGurn and Michael O'Connor. Today we have a special guest with us, Michelle Falcon. He's an entrepreneur, keynote speaker, and best-selling author, most recent book, People First Culture. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, of course. So, you know, just to, to get things kicked off, you know, what is your story and, and how have you gotten to where you are today? You know, as a speaker, an author, uh, you know, give our audience a little run through if they're not familiar with you of, uh, you know, kind of what, uh, what makes you, you. Yeah, um, I'm an entrepreneur and I believe the best way to build a business is by having great relationships with your customers and your employees. Uh, obviously, uh, I don't know one company that would say that those things are bad ideas. Um, my expertise fall within uh, company culture, employee engagement, and customer experience to be specific. Uh, today, I uh, operate, along with my partners, operate a um, portfolio of restaurants uh, in Toronto. So we are in uh, hospitality. Uh, before that, um, I got my start in 2007, uh, working for a, a really popular company here in Canada called 1-800-GOT-JUNK, the furthest thing away from hospitality. Um, <laughs> but, but it was a company that was recognized and admired for its company culture and its customer experience. Um, and it was a true entrepreneurial success story going from uh, this one guy in a pickup truck to franchise business with hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue and uh, still just one owner for the, uh, to the company, which is, you know, in a world where uh, founders are giving up the majority of their company and the majority of their equity uh, to raise capital, that's kind of unheard of having an owner own 100% of the company still and it's scaling to that size. So I learned that was kind of my real world MBA. I was there for five years. That's where I determined that company culture, employee engagement and customer experience uh, was going to be my expertise. 2012, I left the company. I started uh, consulting for companies uh, on those three topics. Uh, I would work with very small companies in, in the early days. Uh, at the time, I lived in Vancouver, uh, Canada. And uh, then eventually the clients started getting bigger. Uh, Verizon Wireless, Subway, electronic arts and so forth. Uh, and then in 2016, I joined my partners to, to open up full service restaurants. Um, the next chapter of my career is going to launch next year. Um, and that will still be in food, but it will be in quick service restaurants. Um, think like Chipotle type operating model. Uh, but what will never change is um, my belief that you have to have a people first culture to build a successful business for the long term, not just for the next couple of years. That's awesome. Yeah, it's so true. And uh, thank you for sharing that the story and your progression. I know that's uh, it's definitely inspiring for us. You know, anytime you get to hear an entrepreneur's journey, it's it's just a fantastic you know, experience to be able to walk through and, and kind of share with, you know, other entrepreneurs. You know, it's, it's, it's just a great testament to the drive that people have. And, you know, one phrase that, that really stuck out to me specifically uh, was that you said, you know, real world MBA experience. Uh, something that I heard recently 
from someone was that the, the best thing they got out of their MBA was the network and <laughs> not, not necessarily even the, you know, the education. How does, how do you relate to that? And, and what do you think about, you know, people who, who just go out there and do it, you know, the YouTube university, the, the real world experience based, based on, uh, or sorry, not based on, but in comparison to the, the education before, you know, going out and venturing there. I believe that you need to learn before you earn. Uh, now, how you learn is predicated on you. I am not the type to say university is irrelevant for business to learn how to be an entrepreneur. That's wrong to say because just because one learning environment doesn't work for me doesn't mean it's not relevant for everybody else. I am not an academic. I'm, I, I don't didn't do well. I tried for, I think it was three semesters in business school. It just wasn't for me. Uh, that real world experience where you can be, go to a department in your company and ask questions. Why are you doing this? Why? And like, why are you doing this? What are the outcomes and so forth? And you don't ask in a critical way. You're just asking for knowledge. And that's what I did for five years. Like I contributed to the success of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, just like my peers and colleagues did. But I almost felt like I was, I had the better deal because I'm like, I'm getting paid to learn, right? And I knew that one day I was gonna use that education to start my own business and perhaps I would be in an advantageous position because I saw real operators doing it. I'm not going to discredit, you know, professors of business school, but that's not who I wanted to learn from because it didn't speak to me, but that's just me. Like I, I, when I'm asked for advice about business and entrepreneurship, I always preface it by saying, this is what works for me. Don't take my word as gospel, go find somebody else to speak to as well and figure out strike a balance between what I'm suggesting and what others are suggesting and what makes sense for you. I don't, I don't know you, right? Like, so that's my kind of, was my approach when I have, you know, when I have children and if they want to start a business of their own one day, my, they come work for the family business, perhaps, um, might I suggest, hey, go to university, but take courses at night. Work in the day, take courses at night. Go, go take an organizational behavior course. Go take an economics course. Take things that are really relevant. The thing that I couldn't stand about getting my business degree is I had to take sociology or, or philosophy. I'm like, mm, not for me, but I'm force fed this education to get a degree. I was like, that doesn't make any sense to me. So what I, I like the idea of work during the day for in a company that you can learn from that has the proper culture of learning and in the evenings go chip away go chip away at that side of the education that you feel is better reserved for academia and now you become a really like a well-rounded uh, source of knowledge to go apply when you want to become your become an entrepreneur yeah, that's great. I think it's, uh, you know, it's really relevant, especially in uh, a lot of startup culture today to have that growth oriented mindset um, and, and the consistent learning and, and push forward for everyone to, you know, just not only be learning for themselves, but helping each other uh, along that path as well. And it's, that's awesome. Um, so, you know, uh, like I said in the intro, your, your most recent book, uh, People First Culture, how did that, you know, come come about you know i'm sure there was a gradual you know entrance into that and you don't you just wake up one day and i'm gonna write a book people first culture you know some people are like that but how did that idea evolve for you and what does that specific phrase mean to you and individually yeah so people first culture is building a business that's admired by your customers your employees your community and and really anybody that interacts with your brand um it's not right to call yourself a people first culture company when you only treat your best customers well and then nobody else gets a good experience like uh operating restaurants 
we want to treat our vendors, the people who sell, sell us meat and produce and alcohol, we want to treat them just as well as we treat the customer that orders a $200 bottle of wine. Why? Because it's the right thing to do, period. Whether you, whether you pay them or they pay you, same thing. And a lot of people have a hard time understanding that. And I don't think that they're um, set out to be leaders within a people first culture type company. Uh, how the book came to me, I, 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 this goes back to me not being an academic. I can't, I can't write to save my life. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I um, tried, tried maybe three different times to write a book. Um, but for me, if there are people who can do it better, hire them to do it. If it's going to save you time, do it, right? Like, and if they're going to produce a better quality work, do it. So I had a company called Scribe Media based in Austin, Texas, actually write my book. And uh, I'm not ashamed to say I had a ghostwriter for my book. And guess what? 95% of business authors all have ghostwriters. I'm just, I'm just comfortable saying it. <laughs> so now let me just describe the process. Like they interviewed me for dozens of hours to get the book out of me. Those are my words. I just didn't phrase it. I didn't put it together. I'm not, you know, grammar, diction, all that good stuff. I'm not good with that. Right. And so is 90% of the planet. Okay. That's why we have communication specialists. Let them do their thing. Let them dig the book out of you. And then they designed the cover. They helped me with the title, like the full title. I'm looking at the book in my office right now. People first culture, build a lasting company by shifting your focus from profits to people. They came up with that title. I, I put forth a bunch of ideas and, and they helped me put it together. They put it on Amazon. They designed it and, and packaged it all together. I wouldn't have done any of that because I, I know myself. So that's just me being real, man. And, and any business author that says that they didn't have help putting the book together, either you're a great writer and you should continue to write more books or you hired somebody. You're just not telling people that. Yeah. No, I, I love that. It reminds me of something I love to say, which is work smart, not hard. And that's not to say like, don't try. That's not to say, you know, don't put effort in it. It means if you need to be resourceful, be resourceful. Like if you're not the writer and you know people who are going to do a better job, then you should take them up on that. You know, get, you know, something that I, I love is surrounding yourself with people that are better than, you You know, whether it's, you know, the, the expertise, whether it's a certain craft that's like, I could do that, but so-and-so could do it better. Like then just do it. Just, just give it to other people to help you. So I, I love, you know, I love your approach to that. I think it's, it's a very good approach and it resonates very well with me personally. So I, I, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, one thing that I do recommend, though, is like still understand the process. Yeah, I was very close to my um, editing manager and the the scribe, which is uh, I guess a different way of saying ghostwriter, uh, because I wanted to understand the process. So I walked away knowing what that book publishing process is like. But I didn't do the heavy lifting, right? Like today, I'm learning how to build the supply chain. I don't know how to do that. So I brought in an expert and I'm paying this person to teach me to do it. But I'm also an observer so that I can walk away with that knowledge. It's just, it's too easy just to write a check. You know, un unless you're Jeff Bezos, you can't write a check for everything, right? Like eventually you're going to have to probably carry the burden yourself at some point and you should have a basis of that knowledge. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, surround yourself with experts. And, you know, if, if I have all the time in the world, then I'll learn the supply chain uh, myself. But like, how much time is that going to take? Three years? I don't have three years. I need to get this done in three weeks. Yeah. That brings up a question for, for from me for you. You know, going going off of what you just said there about understanding the processes behind what you're doing. I think that's so crucial as an entrepreneur to, you know, not just start a company and throw people in and say, do this for me, but to understand what's going on in the back end and understand the, the principles, the core principles of what's going on. Um, and then kind of helping people to mold in that direction. You know, for you, what would you say has been your experience of kind of learning those processes and then integrating them 
into the businesses you're running, you know, like going into full service restaurants, like what, what did it kind of take to, to learn those processes in the beginning and then kind of conceptualize and integrate them into your businesses? I had a unique experience with the full service restaurants because I had zero full service experience, a uh, restaurant experience before going into this venture with my partners who did. So what I did was I asked a lot of questions. I observed, I used my experience in management consulting for other industries uh, to use as a basis. But then I knew that I needed to change them along the way to make them specific for the hospitality industry. Then I would, you know, I would ask questions. I didn't think I had to be right all the time. I would say, Hey, Maddie, what do you think about if we did this this way and he would help me kind of connect the dots and see if it was actually going to work that way because i had blinders right like i didn't have that vast experience but by by kind of front-loading the work and the education by asking questions, being a fly on the wall, I would have a better understanding of how should I approach this knowing these barriers that are going to uh, be in the way for these processes to be successful. And then ultimately, it's just trial and error. Like, as long as that error doesn't cost you six or seven figures, you'll be okay, right? Um, and that's the fun part of invention. Like I'm not Apple who has to ship a product that is absolutely pristine or wall street will crush you. I'm not that right. I can make a mistake, right? Like, so that's how I, that's how I like to approach it. I, I'm very process oriented. Um, you know, if, if you ask anybody that knows me really well, I like system and process, uh, because once it's built, the team can just live within that process um, and, and then off you go. You don't need to be there anymore. Like I like to lead from the back, but front loading the work means that I need to build the processes versions of version one or maybe uh, version 2.0 as well too. But then eventually the team just builds the process based off of the foundation that I created for them. Mm. And that, and that sounds like the, like the title of your book, the people oriented culture of having the team who is, you know, able to do that for you being focused on creating the framework and the structure that they need as people to, to get those jobs done. I think, I think that, go ahead. Go. Yeah. I like, there came a point in, um, during my time with the hospitality company where like I almost became irrelevant and I, that was by design. I built the first processes. How are we going to recruit? How are we going to interview? How are we going to onboard? How are we going to train? What's the guest experience going to be like? What type of processes do we have for that? And then I said, okay, team, off you go. And I would keep my finger on the pulse to know when to build the next version of these processes. But guess where the ideas came from? Them, not me. Although I knew what we needed to do, I didn't want to be force feeding these processes to them anymore. I wanted them to create it because that now increases their engagement because they feel like they built something and they did and they should get the notoriety. I'm, uh, I was reminded of a quote by um, this very popular entrepreneur that nobody knows uh, about. His name is Kirk Kirkoric. Kirk Kirkoric. He, um, I started MGM Grand, so pretty big company. Um, and I really hope I don't butcher his quote, but he <laughs> said, he said, entrepreneurs should take all of the risk and none of the praise. I think that's, mm. and I like that a lot. Mm. That's awesome. Love that. Yeah, I know uh, Mike's a big supporter of uh, MGM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I do. I do like uh, playing blackjack. That is one of the things I enjoy on the side. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. We actually That's awesome. we, we had a trip that we were gonna we were gonna go to, to Vegas and then COVID kind of hit and we're like, oh well, I <laughs> another time. <laughs> if anybody wanted, uh, if 
If somebody knew I was in Las Vegas, they would know exactly where to go to. They would go to the Aria Hotel at the Blackjack table, or if I'm not there, then I am at the Alibi Room, also in the Aria, which is a cocktail lounge right next to the Blackjack tables. <laughs> there you go, you know, right, right back and forth. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds like a really good time right now, damn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll have oh. to. I mean, yeah, that's that's what we were thinking, and uh, plans were foiled. We'll we'll definitely be back there, and we'll have to we'll have to check out the uh, the bar. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> that's fun. Yeah. That's fun. You know, uh, you you touched on something that's really interesting. Uh, you know, the the company culture and the customer experience. You know, what what for you is the relation between the company culture and the customer experience, and like how how do people connect that gap? Essentially, you know, breaking that question down a little bit more, what's your advice for companies that are having a hard time connecting that gap? Because I know a lot of specifically small to medium businesses feel like they have to pick one or the other when they're in startup phase. Yeah, um, I have found that this order works well. Build your company culture first, influence employee engagement, earn a great company culture. And the company culture is really the foundation of the company. Like, are you really going to build your house uh, using balsa wood, right? Like, you know, it's going to collapse. <laughs> um, so what does that culture look like? What does it feel like? What are the values that support the company? And not just values that, you know, you go on Google and are like Amazon's core values. Let's use those ones. Give me one of Warby Parker's. Yeah, these are our values. Okay, now next, what do we do next? That's not it. That's really not it. Like for my next company, I have been working on our purpose statement and our values for four months and legitimately four months. Um, I document what I'm feeling about this company, not just today, but for 10 and 20 years after. And then I write a bunch of stuff and I close my laptop. I come back to it a week or two later. Do I still feel the same way? Do I still want this company to behave this way next year, 10 years from now? And I go back and back and back and forth. Um, because then from there, it's like your company culture is the house party. Now, who are you going to welcome to the party? Every good party is made up of entertaining people who are like-minded not because you have good hors d'oeuvres that's an element of it but it's always the people that make the party so that's where you figure out the employee engagement part and then from there the advantageous position you are in as a leader is that you can just let this company culture that you have built to influence these great team members to take care of your customers. And, you know, what does taking care of them mean? Does that mean wow customer experiences? Sure. If you want a wow customer experience, that's great. But wow is subjective, right? Like wow to me aren't long winded conversations with the bank teller. That's like my opposite of wow. I want to get in and out. My idea of wow is let's you know let's just call it what it is there's a transaction happening here you don't need to talk to me about the vancouver canucks don't really care i'm here to get some banking done get me out of here that's wow to me so that's part of the organization's responsibility is to give them that learning and development to increase that employee engagement so your team members are like wow this is a this is a place like i've never worked before they're actually educating me and they're paying me to be educated. I'm going to do something with this education. And, you know, Mrs. CEO, Mr. CEO, let me, let me do my thing. Let me go wow those customers. Let me go serve those customers well. And let me go build that tech that you've never seen before um, without any bugs, right? Like, that's how I believe in building a business. And quite frankly, I don't want to know any other way of how to build a business. Awesome. Yeah. One, one question that, you know, pops up for me out of those values and, and purpose, what is, what's the 
top one on your list right now, if you don't mind sharing? And, and why do you feel like that's going to resonate into the next five and 10 years? Yeah. Um, I don't have the document in front of me right now. And, and I'm not going to be able to say it verbatim because I haven't fully uh, cemented what they are. But let me tell you the sentiment behind the value I'm trying to create. Okay. Without, I, I just want people to get the job done. Like how I find a word to get into, to represent that or a couple of words, I'll figure that out. But the thing that irks me the most, eh, maybe not the most, but there's, there's it's top five, let's say, is when I'm a consumer and I go and I, and this happened to me the other day, I was at the grocery store, I went to go buy, buy olive oil and there's no olive oil on the shelves. Okay, so be it. I asked an employee that I ran into, or you know, we crossed paths. I said, "Is there more any more olive oil in the back?" Uh, well, there's none on the shelf. I'm like, I, I didn't ask that. <laughs> like, is there any olive oil in the back? <laughs> right? Like, come on, like get the job done. Go, go figure something out. Like, I lead. I, I can't help you as your leader to do that. Right? Like, those individuals should have never been hired. Okay, and like, so it's that for me, like, are you gonna get the job done? Can you be counted on to get it done? Do I need to remind you that the deadline is for this day? Do I need to follow up with you with things that have already been discussed? I don't like that because you know what? We're not children. Okay, I don't need to remind my child, you know, and I don't have children, but I, 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 I expect to have to remind my children to brush their teeth, okay? Yeah. Your kids. Right, like why should that happen in the workplace? Like for me, there's a three to one rule. And I will be bringing this into the next organization and perhaps I'll call it something else. But um, in essence, it, as an employer, as the company, we're gonna do three things for you. We're gonna pay you, we're gonna pay you on time and we're going to give you learning and development opportunities to advance your career and make more money, either here or somewhere else. And I'm fine with that. Go to a competitor, I don't care. Start your own business, that's fantastic. Maybe I'll invest, okay? So those are the three things that we will do. There's one thing that I ask the, company, the team member to do, bring your whole self to work. That's it, right? Now, if you unpack what that means, there's more to it. Live within our core values serve customers exceptionally, treat your peers remarkably. Like just bring your whole self to work. No office BS. Okay, I'm not gonna tolerate any of that because I'm holding up my end of the bargain. I told you I was gonna do these three things and I've done them exceptionally. So <clears throat> going back to, to your question, it's just like, you know, it's almost Nike slogan, just do it, All right? Just, just, just do it, okay? Like. Yeah, I, I want <laughs> when somebody I, I understand when a deadline gets interrupted because of unforeseen circumstances, I can get that, right? There's some things that are gonna happen that are out of people's control. But what I don't get is hearing about it the day it's due. Man, tell me a week in advance, even twenty four hours in advance, forty eight hours, whatever. Don't show up to the meeting where you're supposed to or yeah, don't email me and say, Hey, it's not gonna get done. I was expecting in my inbox. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's so simple. I mean, the, the way you're explaining it, um, you know, it, it's very eloquently said, but it, it's so true. It's so, it's, it's a very relatable point. You know, it's like um, just that last thing you said, like, if it's not going to be, if it's not going to get done on time, like, just let me know rather than like, it just doesn't happen or you let me know you know, in the moment, or you let me know, or I find out, you know, from someone else that didn't get done, like, that's even worse, you know, so it's, it's, it's very true. And, and I think, you know, building that, that culture helps prevent that kind of toxicity within the company. Uh, I think, you know, having those people who are comfortable with you comfortable with each other, you know, from the bottom up from the top down, like, you know, being able to have those transparent conversations, not living in, in fear of like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get fired because of this, but being able to just be like, hey, like, this is the situation. 
like, what do you think we should do? This is what I recommend we do, but I would love to hear your thoughts. You know, like, I, I think that's so important is being able to have, <clears throat> excuse me, being able to have that, that culture that facilitates that communication, that transparency and, and working together rather than against each other. Um, and I think, you know, I think what you're talking, uh, talking on is, is very true. I think you're, you're hitting something there. Yeah, there's, there's one thing that I would speak to as well. Um, and just being great at communicating with each other. And I don't think the traditional schooling system has taught us well at communicating mm -hmm. at all. Um, speaking with conviction, learning to speak, you know, supporting our arguments with facts. That's a you know novel idea, um, <laughs> and and disagreeing, yeah. and debating respectfully, right? Like, and you know, I don't think companies are great at doing that. You know, Netflix. Um, if you study their culture, that's kind of like their thing. They're great communicators. They speak candidly. There's a lot of candor. Um, and that's what I want in my company. Like, if you have, if I'm doing something that is bothering you, I have an idea. Tell me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Instead of stupid, like, I'm, but, but with that being said, like, how approachable is the leader? Not, right? Like, that, it's not, I can't blanket everybody, every leader, and, and suggest that, people would feel comfortable knocking on the CEO's door and like, Hey, can I tell you something that I don't like about you? <laughs> like I would I, le legit. If somebody said that to me, I'd be like, wow, you have my attention. Sit down. Look, man, like, are you going to be the first person that tell, tells me that I'm an, an a-hole? No, <laughs> like stand in line. Um, but um, no, like in, in all actuality and truth, like, I want those conversations. Like Michelle, I don't like that you did this. Okay, let's understand. Let's let's unpack this. Why? But one thing I'm really advocating right now is um, the notion of opinions are formed in the absence of communication. So if I don't communicate to my team why I am doing X, Y, Z or why I've asked them to do one, two, three, they're going to go home and come to their own opinion, uh, form their own opinions. And more often than not, they're misinformed, but that is the leader's fault for not communicating. So that's going to be a huge uh, pillar to our company. It's just being master communicators. And like, think of what that might do for our team members uh, personal lives. Right? They'd be better communicators with their kids, with their spouses, with their parents, because we help them teach and we taught them how to communicate properly and we help them in that regard. I think that's really cool. I, I, I think businesses should take that opportunity to really shape the lives of their employees' personal lives as well, too. And, and you know, that could extend to a many, many different things. Like, does the company help employees explore philanthropy and then because of that they continue those efforts in their personal lives but then they recruit their family members like that's a cool company right like for me I, I look i'm very capitalistic in a certain respect um i think parts of the world have gone too capitalistic and we have forgotten to uh feel things um but uh, so I, I, I say that because I do expect to earn a profit and, um, you know, every quarter. And uh, but I, how I go about earning that profit is just a little bit different. Uh, and that's pretty much what the book is about. Like, how can you still earn a profit but have a soul? Mm. Yeah. And I, I think it's so interesting, too, because we we actually just had another episode where, you know, there is this uh, a CEO of his own company. And and, you know, one of the one of the new hires, one of the youngest people on the team went right to him and just said, hey, I don't like this, you know, and just and just told him. And, and it was very similar. He's like, thank you. Thank you so much. And like appreciated that. And it's, it's so true. And I know, you know, something that I personally love and 
and have encountered too, just like throughout life. I mean, you know, business, but also whether it's family, friends, you know, whatever the case may be, you want like, anytime someone, you know, comes to me and has a complaint has, you know, like, Oh, well, I don't like this. Or why did you do this? It, the first thing I say is like, well, thank you. You know? And, and if I find out that people are frustrated, you know, or go behind you and they're complaining, the first thing is like, well, what do you want me to do? Like, I don't know this is happening. So why do you expect me to have, you know, an answer for it? Like I, you didn't bring it to my attention. I can't fix what I don't know. That's the bottom line is I can't fix what I don't know. And so if you let me know about it, then that enables me to fix it. And I, I just, I love that you kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah likewise. I, I think it's, it's really interesting how a company's growth and progress will get so locked down without that open door policy. Because as you know, leaders and as founders and, and people who are running a business, if you don't have the right culture, it's the hardest for those people to grow because they're not getting the feedback. You know, if you're on a team and you have a manager or a leader, um, you know, whatever title you want to put to that, who's, who's leading that team, uh, the CEO, the, the CFO, um, you know, the, the chief operating officer, all of those people are, are overseeing, you know, teams. And those teams are constantly getting feedback on, you know, growth. How can we get better? You know, what are our metrics? You know, what are, what are we looking forward to in the future? And, and they're getting that constant feedback. And I think, you know, something that you touched on is like being able to knock on that door and say, hey, I didn't like this is, is really important. Because if you don't have that, then your leaders can't grow either. And if your leaders can't grow, then there's only so much the rest of the team can grow. And I think it's, it's really, really important to have both, both directions of that street of communication and, and being able to say, Hey, like you need to, you need to work on this. Mm. Yeah. I like that. Mm. Yeah. And having that, like you mentioned, having the communication aspect that is so, so important. Like you were mentioning, I know, and I know just for the three of us, like it took us a while to like kind of learn better how to communicate just with each other, let alone our teams and the people that we work for and with, how has that been for you, you know, communicating with your partners and people that you work directly with on the, on the macro level? For me, fine. Um, but I'll speak generally. I think some people are just conflict averse where they might not want to say something directly because it might offend somebody. They might get upset and there might end up in a shouting match or something. Right. Um, but you got to break through that. Mm -hmm. And I, I can think of some individuals that I know um, who are close to me who are like that. Um, they still get their message across one way or another, whether it's through someone else or, or they, they, finally had their breaking point and they just had a Ned Flanders moment and just exploded. Um, but I, I like, it's just getting past that. Like what's sounds worse speaking your mind and what's what you, how you're feeling or going home and stewing on that. Right. Like, just rip the bandaid off. Speak diplomatically with respect. Don't give the other person the um, opportunity to be offended. And then you're, you know, you're halfway down the road, right? But share your opinion and communicate with the goal of coming to a resolution or some sort of fair conclusion. Like, you know, if somebody comes to me like knock, 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 knocks on my door, if I you know, prefer not in an open office environment, but uh, ask me to, to speak and are not pleased with something, one of my first questions is going to be, what's the solution? Like, what did you want to see happen instead? And, and how would you justify that? You know, you're going to lose me if it's like, well, well I don't know. I'm like, All right. Well, why don't you go think about that first? Um, and then come back and let's have an engrossing conversation. But cause you know that like, I didn't make a decision without thinking it through, especially if it was going to impact you and other team members. Here's the logic behind why I made this decision. 
But this is going back to what I said earlier, is that you have to paint that picture for your team and say, we're making this decision because of one, two, three, four, five reasons. Not just we're going to make this decision, all right, off you go. It's not fair to your team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know, uh, I know that uh, you have a, a meeting coming up, so we want to be able to respect your time, but I just wanted to ask Mike and Chris, do you guys have any uh, last quick questions for Michelle? I guess kind of my very, very last question is you're in the, you know, you've been in the food industry, you've run restaurants, opened them and everything, but what is your favorite, and that's just personal, personal preference question, like what's your favorite like genre of food? Like, is there a, you always eat Italian or Chinese or something like what's, what's your food like preferences and has that affected you in business at all? I would say Italian, um, easily Italian. That's like my go-to. Like I know this weekend on Saturday, I was either going to get Italian or Jamaican. So I'm going to go with Jamaican because I always have Italian. But, um, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Italian food's very versatile, um, which I like. Because you can have your pasta, you can have your pizza, you can have your risotto. You like it's, it's just very versatile and I like that. Um, and you... I had a question around how has it impacted my business or anything? Yeah. Um, not yet, but I love the idea of having just one, finding a pizziolo, so a professional uh, pizza artist, finding like the best, funding just a little restaurant for him or her, not expecting any profit they keep it all i just want a pizza place i can go to until i'm dead and just eat <laughs> one like and just sit and eat espresso and have pizza like that is my dream like one of my dreams where like i'm just i can barely get into the store because i'm so old and i eventually sit down and i eat but that's like my idea of heaven is just having a nice pizza and a nice espresso uh when i don't care about my physique or health like no i'll always care about my health but when i don't care to be fit i'll eat it every day right so that it hasn't impacted my career yet but that's something that i really really excites me um because pizza is just amazing and so is espresso italian's got it going on you really have it going on Talk yeah. about people first. Pizza, I think, is, is right there with people first. So, <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. Eh? Uh, I think my last question, just to go off of that real quick, is I, I see the Yankees hat, so I'm assuming you're yeah. a pretty big fan. So I, I just wanted to say, like, it's part of that dream watching a Yankees game, you know, in that little shop, in that little uh, pizzeria. So truth be told, I actually don't care for the Yankees. I, I, um, I, it's not that I, I'm indifferent. It's just the nicest hat I've ever bought. Um, it's different. It's not, this isn't the, so this isn't like, this is a, like a dry fit Nike Yankees hat with these like little polka dots on it. It's got a Velcro strap. It's the most comfortable hat I've ever worn. And like truth be told, it's, it's probably become unhygienic because I've worn this hat like since quarantine. I've probably worn it at least five days a week for two months. So it's time to get a new one. But um, yeah, not really a Yankees fan, man. I, I do appreciate the history, though, uh, of the New York Yankees. Um, and they're, they're, they're just a, they're, they've always been a super team before yeah. LeBron created his super team with D Wade <laughs> and uh, Chris Bosch. But um, right. Right. sure, put the Yankees game on in this pizza place. I won't turn it off. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Michelle. Everybody listening, uh, go give Michelle a follow on Instagram. Uh, connect with him on LinkedIn. He's got his own podcast, Breaking It Down. Uh, we're going to link all those in the, in the show notes. So, so go show him some love. And, uh, again, thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. You know, Thanks, uh, guys. I, I appreciate uh, you giving me the time. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Of course. Uh, of course. For everyone listening in, until next time. Oh,